on behalf of Jerry's family and church family, I welcome you to Path Apostolic Church. We're here to celebrate the life and the memory of Jerry Nur, And we're here to glorify his God. If you knew Jerry, then you know he loved to praise Jesus. Whether he was in church or on a job site or in the truck, wherever Jerry was, he was glorifying God. I won't forget the first time he joined us for worship. I think they played one note on the keyboard and the brother was standing up with his hands in the air. He wasn't waiting on anybody else's cue. He wasn't waiting on someone to say, let's all stand. I wonder if we could follow his example right now. Would you stand with me? And before we pray, before we share, before we do anything else, why don't we follow the example that he set, and even in the midst of the valley, let's stand together and sing this old, timeless praise song, How Great Thou Art. Would you join us? Oh, Lord, my God. When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout. The universe display. Sing it with us. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul. That God, His Son, not sparing, sent Him to die. I scarce can take it in. That on that cross, my burdens gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. Shouts of acclamation and take me home. What joy will fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great thou art! Then see.
declaration of praise to Jesus Christ. Would you clap your hands unto the Lord our God and magnify him in this dark valley? He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our glory. And even now, he is great. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We're so glad to have you with us today. Jerry David Nur, Jr. He was born October 13th, 1984. He passed from this life to the eternal on October 15th, 2023, just a couple of days after his birthday. Jerry and his sister Michelle were raised by mom Joanne and dad Art. He was a loving and a devoted husband, Jerry, and a father. And he leaves behind his grieving wife, Joni, daughters, Allie, Kaylani, and stepkids, Jimmy and Nicole. Ringo still waits for dad to throw the ball. Jerry grew up in Loxahatchee, Florida, working the family's nursery and farm. But he didn't just know plants and trees and construction. He knew hunting, fishing, air boating. But somewhere along the way, Jerry found himself in prison. And before you judge, just remember the Apostle Paul said, such were some of us. Whether you were in a concrete cell or a bars or not, we've all been in chains in prison. He decided there to leave a life of addiction and affliction behind. And he cried out to the Lord. Jesus heard his cry. Somebody say amen. If you know it, we all made that cry. If you haven't today, you can. He hears that cry. After that cry, he began a brand new journey. And when Jerry got out, he immersed himself in Jesus Christ. He, he joined Alcoholics Anonymous. That is one of the largest discipleship programs in the world, whether you know it or not. <laughs> Some folks don't even know they're being discipled. And he joined a spirit-filled church down there. He met his wife to be Joni. And together they opened Titan Construction right here in Titusville. Jerry's family and friends remember a man of God and a man of integrity. A man who touched hearts, he touched lives everywhere he went. A model husband, a father, a businessman, a mentor. And his willingness to sacrifice and to support and to give to just about anybody. Everybody he knew. Today we remember and we celebrate Jerry Nur. Now the family has selected a few friends to represent the host that's gathered. Obviously we'd be here all week if everybody got the mic. <clears throat> I know you're thankful that we're not doing that. But the family has selected a handful of people, and he considered this man to be his mentor in industry and his mentor in life. Now, you'll notice that there's a little microphone over here, and there's a microphone here. We just make this available for those that don't like stages. I don't know what the deal is, but somehow folks will step over there quicker than they'll step here. Uh, but if you'd prefer one way or the other... When I call your name, whichever mic you prefer, it'll be ready for you. We're glad that you're here. I wonder if you would welcome Mr. Gene Lloyd. Gene, come and tell us about Jerry Nerd. When I first met Jerry, 
I was on a construction site and he was introduced to me and I said hi and he said hi and he kept hanging around and I'd look around and Jerry would be there and uh, so finally I stopped and we talked and he goes, I don't know if you know this or not, but you're going to be my mentor. <laughs> and I said, well, okay. And uh, that was about four years ago or so, and we, uh, we really bonded. We talked, I don't know if I can say daily, but we talked a lot, and we met a lot. I never rode in his truck very much because I couldn't get up there. <laughs> I don't know that I've met a guy as young as Jerry that had so much impact on people. He had a huge heart, a huge heart. He loved people. Um, his crew, he would call me and he would sometimes be crying over some of the men in his crew. I practiced this at home and I never cried. But Jerry, there's one thing that he loved Jesus Christ. God changed his life. I did not know him before, and, um, but God had changed his life. He loved the Lord. You weren't around him very often, very, very long before he brought Jesus Christ up and they were you stand and just how he loved the Lord. That was first. And he talked about his family, talked about Joni and how he wanted to be the expression of Christ to her and to his kids. And how he wanted to be just the example that God wanted him to be. There was a, a story that I tell about being on a construction site and we were clearing a road and this road went back probably 500 feet and was going through pine trees, some small, some big, uh, but there was a, just a ton of them. So they cleared this road and I mean, it looked great. I mean, these trees were 30 and 40 feet tall. And um, I um, was there and I said, well, this, this is great. I came back the next day and a lot of the smaller trees couldn't stand up on their own. And they started dripping over, drip, drip, drooping over the road. And um, the Lord just kind of spoke to me. He says, you know, everybody needs someone to stand up beside them. And Jerry was that guy that stood up beside everybody. He, um, he was a rock. And um, I, um, like you all, I'm going to miss him. I uh, texted him the other day. So he knew he was missed. Thank you, Gene, for being available to him, being the example and mentor that you were. He spoke of you all the time. The friendship is clear. This wasn't a business relationship. Another friend and a fellow AA sponsor, Mr. Stevie B, is here. 
Stevie B, come and share about your friend. Hi, everybody. My name is Stevie B, and, uh, and I am a recovered alcoholic. And, you know, I didn't know Jerry as intimately as some of you. And I don't need to come up here and tell you how amazing he was and generous he was and how blessed and a blessing he is because the church is filled. But I want you to know that years ago, when Jerry was working for the other team, and I really mean he was working for the other team, this day the Lord had already seen. And the service, the funeral, the memorial was not being held in here. The memorial was being held in a little strip mall, church front type of thing, and there was six people there. Three of the six had resentments because Jerry did not live up to the person he could have been. And the Bible says that God will leave the 99 for the one. And at that time, God came up with a plan. And he started sending teams of his angels around Jerry so that when the 28th or the 26th or whatever the date was of this week, 2023 happened that not only the church would be filled which is great but that heaven would gain a saint because the bible says that god does not want one person mom and grandmom to perish and jerry was on his way to perishing which means being separated from jesus and god for all time he was going to be separated from God for all time because he had not made a decision to turn his will and his life over to the care of that God. And so while he was away, God started to send some angels to get in touch with Jerry. And trust me, those angels probably when they first met Jerry, they probably were as scared as anyone else that first met Jerry. But they got his attention. They showed him that, no, there's not one that's good. Nobody in this audience, not the pastor, not all the pastors there. There's not one good apart from Christ. And they started to show him the truth that there's no sin that has ever been committed that cannot be forgiven. They, start, they showed Jerry that, don't worry, God has already come for that sin. And then there was teams assembled, and I was, I'm great, but like, who is this guy, Stevie B, that's introduced himself as an alcoholic? I was blessed to be on one of the teams after Jerry got out in Hollywood, Florida, and I got a bunch of my people over here. We all went through a little, we, we, we went, they went through a little house called JC's house, Jesus Christ house in Hollywood, Florida. And I was blessed to be on one of his teams that continued to remind him, not that I needed to, of who he is because of whose he is. Amen. So when he wanted to maybe take some shortcuts, because you know in the business world, it's much easier to take shortcuts than do it the right way, he never did, as far as I could see. When he was having situations with friends and intimate situations, he would call me and said, Stevie, what would you do, what would you and your wife Sandra do in this situation? Because the Bible says that wisdom comes in a multitude of counsel. And one thing you want to, I'm telling you about Jerry, he had a multitude of counsel. He has wise people all around him. One of the wisest things he ever did was have wise people around him. Which we heard, got to hear his mentor and we know all his circle. They're all wise because they have one ear to the Lord and one ear to the words. And you know, I'm blessed to know Jerry. I'm blessed to know him. He, you know, um, his mentor said that he was a rock. But he was only a rock because he knew the rock. 
He was only a rock because he knows Jesus Christ is the rock. He stood on that foundation. You couldn't be with him five seconds, five minutes, five hours without hearing the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because those that have been forgiven much, and Jerry was forgiven much, they owe much, and they love much. And Jerry owed much, and he loved much. I have a lot of ties to this area because Rob and Jerry brought me up one time to speak at the church up here, at the church they were going to at the time. And then from that time, Jerry, who I, who I call the glue. I call him the glue because if he's around, everybody wants to be around. So as mentor said, the rock, I call him the glue. He's an orchestrator. People want to be around him. They feel safe around him. And God knew that years ago that we would be standing here today. So before you get yourselves, of course, earthly sorrow is understanding. Where it's understandable to have earthly sorrow. God understands that. God wept. He wept when one of his friends died, and he knew that his friend was going to be raised up from the dead, and he still wept. So it's okay to have earthly sorrow. But I want you to know that God had a plan for Jerry his whole life. That's one of the reasons he was so special. He knew that today, 300 plus people just in here and thousands out there that know Jerry in, in South Florida and all the different places, Loxahatchee and all the different places he's, he's lived in, would hear the Jerry Near story. You see, in the recovery community, I've stood at this pulpit many times in different churches, many, 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 many times to talk about my brothers and sisters that have overdosed that it went home to the Lord early because they missed the mark. However, in this case, Jerry did not miss the mark. He lived his life the way the Lord intended. And when he opened up the gates in heaven, the Lord said what we all want to hear, and those that make it a decision for Jesus Christ and follow him will hear this. Jerry got to hear, well done good and faithful servant until we see you again brother jerry and we will see you again we love you we appreciate you we'll see you up with our lord and savior jesus christ amen thank you man god bless you god speaking of the rock he is the pastor of the Rock Church. But his relationship with Jerry was not just religious. He's a friend. I wonder if you would welcome Pastor Oscar Longoria. Come and share a few words, Pastor. Welcome, man. Absolutely. I wasn't prepared for this, um, but God is faithful. Uh, amazing to just to see uh, how many people have been impacted by Jerry Nur, uh, including myself, my family. Uh, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is uh, some disciples were looking for Jesus after he died. An angel appeared and said, why are you seeking the living among the dead? Jesus is risen. And make no mistake, <laughs> Jerry's not dead. He's more alive than any of us right now, worshiping the King of Kings that he loves so much. My uh, introduction to Jerry was uh, a godsend. Uh, we had uh, been given a, a church that was very old and debilitated, and it all happened during the pandemic. And uh, there was some work that needed to be done. It had been neglected for a long time and sought out some contractors. I've been a uh, in the construction industry for, for over 30 years. And I kept hearing this, oh, this is going to be real hard. This is going to be real expensive. And I was like, okay, you know, well, whatever. And out of nowhere, I don't, I don't, it was a divine appointment. I'm at the church, and this dude shows up in this big truck. <laughs> so, man, it's a big truck. <laughs> the guy gets out, and I'm like, man, that's a big dude. <laughs> no wonder, right? Couldn't see this guy getting out of a Yugo, right? <laughs> For those of you who are old enough to know what a Yugo is. Uh, but he looked at it, and I didn't say anything. And I'm like, hey, this is what I want to do. He's like, oh, this is going to be easy. And I'm like, oh, there's my guy, right? 
And so uh, that's where our friendship began and uh, got to meet his uh, amazing wife. And I had the privilege of, uh, I was shocked really, that uh, to do their vow renewal. It was a privilege and an honor. And quite frankly, I, I, their love for each other, man, they were they're madly in love. They are madly in love. And it was a beautiful ceremony, and it was amazing just to see them committed to renewing their vows, to uh, be faithful to the covenant they made between themselves and the Lord. And uh, it was a beautiful thing to have a front row seat to that. But one of the things I loved about Jerry is he would be my, my he would listen, and we would listen to each other as, as we both have struggles. And and as pastors, we can only talk to a few people. Pastors struggle, just so you know. Don't, don't ever stop praying for your pastors. Uh, if a pastor's not struggling, I'm saying something's wrong. All right, We have an enemy, and, uh, but he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And Amen. And uh, I just remember there were times we, we just started saying, hey, man, if you ever need encouragement, we were both the same way. Hey, yeah, if you ever need encouragement. And uh, I love the C.S. Lewis quote that says, Friendship is born at the moment when one person says to another, oh, you too? I thought I was the only one. So that was a, a beautiful thing and where that friendship was born. And uh, we'd talk and he'd be like, oh, this, that. And then, well, hey, let's pray, you know. And, and then me, I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm going through this, that, and the other. And he'd go, well, yeah, let's pray, you know, because prayer changes things. It, it's unfortunate that sometimes we do that as a last resort when it should be the first resort. God is faithful. And all I could think is, man, how, how awesome. And, and we were invited. Uh, we would come, you know, they would come to our house to have dinner. They would invite us to their house to have dinner. And such good hosts, uh, amazing hospitality. And uh, we would talk. And I remember last, it, was, it was like a week and a half or so before he died. We were at their house, and we're encouraging each other. And he was sharing some struggles. And I'm like, bro, thank you so much for sharing these. I feel better in the sense that I'm not the only one, but let's pray, right? And uh, it was such a beautiful and encouraging thing. And uh, our, our construction thing, it was a challenge when he was doing everything and, and it got completed and everything passed without fail. There was never any issues, incredible workmen that he had working for them and was also that he was mentoring them. Um, and he fought hard because we were having some issues with the county and, uh, and I was like, Jerry, are we going to have to call fire down from heaven? Like, <laughs> like, what's going on here? But he took care of business, and he was, he was so good at, at uh, just everything he did, and, and an amazing personality. Um, but let's not forget, he, he's alive, and he's experiencing things that we just can't even imagine, right? And so because God is so much greater and above and beyond us, right, his ways aren't our ways, I always equate it to, imagine your little kids, how, how many people have kids, right, have raised kids here? And you as an adult, you know what's up, you, you know what to look for, you know where there's trouble and, and what's going on, but kids are like going right for it, and you're like, no, and they're like, what, why? Well, same with God, you know, his ways are above us, we don't understand, but one thing I know, it just must have been mission accomplished for Jerry, because the Bible says that he is faithful to complete the work that he started in him and that work was completed and now he's in glory. And we will all see them. Those of you who have put your faith and hope and trust in Jesus Christ are going to see him again. And all this is going to be just nothing but a distant memory. He is faithful. He's so faithful. The Bible says he's faithful even when we're faithless. So just our heart and our prayers go to the family who I know this deeply hurts. Again, the, the shortest verse in the Bible is he wept. It's okay to cry. There's, there's that season. But joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. So thank you for, for listening. And, and uh, man, God bless uh, this family. And uh, one day there's going to be an amazing reunion and, uh, where, where he will wipe our tears from our eyes. And like uh, the gentleman said before me, well, we'll hear those amazing words. Well done, good and faithful servant. God bless you guys. Thank you. When we were, thank you, Pastor, we couldn't have planned that any better. That uh, 
Stevie B would talk about the rock. You thought we actually put this together, but no. Maybe the Holy Spirit is at work where two or three are gathered in his name. Maybe the Lord's at work. We were gathered with the family, kind of laying out the flow of things. And um, I said, was there a favorite song that Jerry had? I mean, you know, even an old hymn or whatever, I, a new hymn, a great song, a worship song, a praise song. Maybe not the Eagles or Led Zeppelin, but you know, something <laughs> for the funeral. <laughs> And, I mean, you barely took a breath. She said, he won't fail. And I said, no, he won't. Oh, you mean the song. Would you lift your heads to your father? Lift your hearts to your father. And if you, if you feel it, would you just begin to pray for the family of Jerry Nur right now? I know they intellectually know this. But Paul said that there's a knowledge in the brain, and then there's knowledge in experience. There are two different kinds of knowledge. Would you pray right now as we lift up this song at the family's request for the family? Intercede for them. In the spirit, God knows he won't fail them. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause he's never let me down He's faithful through service is over. 
there'll be wind, and there'll be rain, but he won't fail. You can make this your testimony today. says none come unless wooed or drawn by the Spirit. You can't make somebody do anything. But if you feel led and the person near you is open, would you just gently and respectfully place your hand on their shoulder, maybe on their arm? Don't intrude, but if it's right. And I wonder if you would begin to just profess this bridge as a testimony.
fail. Glory to God. He won't fail. Joni, Allie, and Kaylani, he will not fail you. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Joe, Art, Betty, Michelle, family, friends, Jesus will not fail you. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will be a comforter to you. His Holy Spirit will walk you through any valley, even the valley of the shadow of death. I wonder if this congregation could say in unison, he is with you. I'm just seeing Mike for the first time. I hear he's got a nickname. (laughs) You don't need to worry about it around here, man. That nickname's just fine. But Jerry called him a son. Michael, come and tell us about Jerry. My name is Michael, and I, too, am a recovered alcoholic. You know, I just want to share a few things about Jerry. I met Jerry in church, and uh, he came up and shook my hand. And at the time, I was in a, how can I, I guess you can say a dark place. I was traveling for work, you know, missing my family, not being able to attend uh, regular Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, and... uh, We just got to talking, and, you know, he said, like, what kind of work do you do? And I'm like, I'm in construction. And he's like, oh, really? And, uh, you know, we began to work together. And, um, you know, it's funny how God puts people in your life. And, you know, he, I believe God put Jerry in my life for a reason, you know. And uh, the two of us did some really awesome things in this town, you know. And the thing that I think is the coolest is that we say we're restoring the past and building the future. And, you know, I can say and testify that that's what God did in Jerry's life. And that's what he did in my life. And the thing is, is looking at all these people here, you know, it shows you that Jerry showed the reckless love of God. And his heart was full of hope, you know, and uh, I'm grateful for that. You know, I'm grateful that uh, I have the ability to uh, love on the family and uh, try to continue this legacy that he had. You know, Um, they're big shoes, so it's going to take, you know, four or five of us to fill those shoes. But I truly believe with God guiding us, it can be done. You know, and and today is a celebration, and you usually celebrate when you have a victory, right? And today, we have a victory. We have a victory in Jesus Christ. I'm going to have to get these glasses out, because I sure can't see this paper. When I found this, it, it, I don't know. God put it on my heart because this, to me, is exactly what Jerry would say to us. To my dearest family and loved ones, some things I'd like to say, but first of all, to let you know that I have arrived okay. I am writing this from heaven where I dwell with God above, where there's no more tears or sadness there. It's just eternal love. Please do not be unhappy just because I'm out of sight. Remember that I'm with you every morning, noon, and night. That day I had to leave you when my life on earth was through, God picked me up and hugged me, and he said, I welcome you. It's good to have you back again. You were missed while you were gone. As for your dearest family, they'll be here later on. I need you here so badly. It's part of my big plan. There's so much that we have to do to help our mortal man. Then God gave me a list of things he wished for me to do, and foremost on that list of mine is to watch and care for you. And I will be beside you every day and week and year, and when you're sad, I'm standing there 
to wipe away the tear. And then when you lie in bed at night, the day's chores put to flight, God and I are closest to you in the middle of the night. When you think of my life on earth and all those loving years, because you're only human, they're bound to bring you tears. But do not be afraid to cry. It does not relieve the pain. Remember, there would be no flowers unless there was some rain. I wish that I could tell you of all that God has planned, but if I were to tell you, you wouldn't understand. But one more thing is for certain, though my life on earth is o'er, I'm closer to you now than I ever was before. And to my very many friends, trust God knows what's best. I'm still not far away from I'm just beyond the crest. There are rocky roads ahead of you and many hills to climb, but together we can do it, taking one day at a time. It was my philosophy, and I'd like it for you too, that as you go into the world, so the world will give to you. If you can help somebody who is in sorrow or in pain, then you can say to God at night, my day was not in vain. And now I am contended that my life, it was worthwhile, knowing as I passed along the way, I made somebody smile. So if you meet somebody who is down and feeling low, just lend a hand to pick him up as on your way you go. When you're walking down the street and you've got me on your mind, I'm walking in your footsteps only a half a step behind. And when you feel the gentle breeze or the wind upon your face, that's me giving you a great big hug or just a soft embrace. And when it's time for you to go from that body to be free, remember you're not going, you're coming here to me. And I will always love you from that land way above. We'll be in touch again. P.S. God sends his love. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. We've uh, allowed Joni and Allie and Kehlani to come together if they choose, just to be strength for each other. Wherever you guys want to stand is perfectly fine. I wonder if you would welcome his immediate family. Tell us about your husband and father. I don't think my girls are going to come up here. <laughs> They're chickens. Um, <laughs> Oh, uh, well, all right. I only have one chicken. <laughs> so yesterday um, was our six-year anniversary to Jerry and I getting engaged. And as I looked through that post and just remembered that evening, and it, it, he was such a good husband to me. Yeah, he was such a good husband to me, you know, like from the minute that we got, that I met him, even when I made him just be my friend, I wasn't going to be his girlfriend. He had to be my friend first, but um, he would grab my hand and say, I'm going to put a rock right there. And he did. <laughs> he did. But he did more than just that. I, I can honestly stand up here and say that my husband loved me the way that Christ loves the church. He absolutely did. We had such an amazing biblical marriage, and we strived for that. And we didn't know what that looked like when we got married. We struggled our first year. We almost, we thought about divorce, and then we remembered that we made a commitment not only to each other but to God, and that we were going we to do this thing. And God has truly blessed us with everything that we have, just how quickly Titan came about and just grew and, you know, People that were in town for years would say to them, wow, it took me 20, 30, 40 years to build this up, and you've been here for four or five years, and look at this. Uh, he just was an amazing guy. He really was. But um, you guys saw the picture out front with Jerry with that big tomahawk steak. There's a funny story behind that steak. One where he, he, so he gets this steak and this thing is like $80 and he's so excited. He marinates it for two, three days, I think, and is finally ready to grill this barbecue, this giant tomahawk steak. Well, about an hour later, I hear a bunch of expletives and screaming and he comes flying into the house. 
telling me that he's either going, that he's going to sling the grill into the cul-de-sac because that's going to make it right, or the only other thing that would make it right would be to go get another one and to do it. And so that is what he did. He had to repent so much for what came out of his mouth. It was insane. <laughs> but that was, so when I saw that picture, it just, it brought me a lot of joy. But, you know, Jerry was a very good man. He was there for anyone. He would listen to anybody's problems. He was there to help people that didn't even treat him right. And uh, I didn't understand that a lot, um, but that was what he chose to do. And that's what made him more like Jesus and me less like Jesus in that moment. <laughs> but he was, he was just a very forgiving person. He didn't want to have any ill feelings with anyone. He was, he's a good dad. I got some amazing girls here, and I got my little nugget down there. But um, Jerry would have wanted anyone here that if you don't know the Lord, if you know Jerry, get to know his God, because that's what made Jerry, Jerry. That's why he became the man that he did, because he was obedient to the Lord and nothing more. So that's all you need. Uh, if, you, if you have are not saved or if you've not been baptized, please talk to the pastors here. Don't leave here without that. My husband would want that. He would want you to go in the water. <laughs> I can tell you right now. <laughs> but I just want to say thank you to everyone, and I'm sure I'll be seeing you all, you know, as uh, the time goes by. And I just want to say thank you so much for loving my husband the way that you did. And, and um, I'm just so grateful. Thank you, everyone. Did you want to sing? Thank you. Great job. It is uh, telling to look around the audience. All of us have been to a memorial service of some kind. And uh, these days, I've been pastoring for 16 years, and I can honestly say in that short window of time, uh, the attendance to memorial services and celebrations of life are, are less and less. And I mean even pre-pandemic. We blame everything on the pandemic. But the truth is, is that I think it reminds us too much of our mortality. It reminds us too much that we're not invincible. And um, to look at in this day and age and see a house full. Uh, you've heard this reference by everyone that's come to this platform. This is not common. Pastor, it's not this common all the time. And I just want to thank you. I know we already have. But this, can, can you spread the word that this is how we say goodbye to people? That this is how we honor life, not just when they come in, but when they go out? I, I'm not trying to get preachy on this note. It just is, it's a great testimony. It's a testimony of a, of a life well lived, but it's also a testimony of true friends. So I honor you and I applaud you. I thank the family for your boldness. It's not easy to get up. It's easy to talk about Jerry, but it's not easy to get up in front of a big crowd and do this. And I thank you for your boldness to come up and share. Now, I was given marching orders when we met <clears throat> in the meeting. And she said, Jerry, what's about Jesus? Tell him about Jesus. So you know about Jerry, and it sounds like a lot of you know about Jesus. Some of y'all are like, yep, yeah, this is about time to go get some cutlets. Go get a sweet tea. John 3.16. Does anybody remember hearing that from Jerry at all? John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son... That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Apparently, this was his verse. This was his scripture. He quoted it in its entirety or partially at many times throughout the day to anyone that would listen. He posted it everywhere, I'm told, as well. It's the promise of salvation. It's the promise of deliverance. Earlier, I spoke about AA being a part of a discipleship process because, you know, at, as church folks, you kind of think discipleship takes place in classroom one, two, and three. Uh, discipleship takes place instructional. I had an elder in Kansas City, Missouri, sit down at dinner and just tell me how the cow ate the cabbage, as they say in the Midwest. And he said, Jody, your discipleship program is instructional. Discipleship is relational. He said, tell me how many times Jesus told his followers, meet me at the synagogue, and we'll talk about it. He said they walked with him every day for three years plus. Discipleship is relational. And in the rooms that I've been to, 
I have seen people that you, you hear the word discipleship and it sounds religious, but really the root of it is discipline. That's the same word. And discipline is about process. It's about progressive steps. It's about accountability one to another, real accountability. And so I would encourage you not to be afraid of true discipleship because that's what Jesus did. John 3.16 was Jerry's promise, but John 3.16 has an entire chapter. I don't know about you, but I like to get favorite verses, just clips, and I like to focus on a key power verse or something, but sometimes we miss the context when we don't read the whole chapter, when we don't understand the context, because yes, John 3.16 is Jerry's promise, but John 3 and 3 revealed the process, because the whole conversation about this concept of being saved begins with Nicodemus and Jesus talking in 3 and 3. Jesus answered and said to him, speaking of Nicodemus, most assuredly I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Yes, Nicodemus was a little literal. Verse 5, Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The first time is see the kingdom, the second time is enter the kingdom. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from. Where it goes, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Being born again is not about church membership. It's not about joining a church. It's not about signing a membership card. Those things can come along with it. Being, I mean, when we had hands raised up a little while ago, how many people have had children or raising kids? That the child didn't show up at your door with a little card and say, "Can I be a member of your household?" There was a birthing process. You can't sweep that under the rug. Being Jesus chose the analogy of born again because it is a significant, undeniable event. It's not something that you look back and go, yeah, I don't. we celebrate birthdays every year. There is no greater birthday on the calendar than the day that you are born again of the water and of the Spirit. That's the truth. And so I listened to Jerry's testimony personally from him. And then secondarily through his wife, and then through all of you today. His salvation was not a scripted prayer. That's not what he described to me. His deliverance from addiction was not a religious ritual. He was born again. He was born again. And by born again, Jerry didn't just show up and say, can I have the Christian uniform and put that cloak on? And now I'm a Christian. And, and he, he said, this is my old life. I'm just going to cover it with this Christian cloak. No, he, he didn't just update his old life. It wasn't Jerry old life 2.0. Jerry's old life ended. When you have a birth of something, folks, the child doesn't come out and say, yeah, let me tell you about the nine months I spent in there. That's over. You don't go back in there. New birth is about old things passing away and all things becoming new. It's, it's sad to me that we have sold as ministers sometimes, I, I apologize if I have done this, a Christianity that says add this to your current life. It's an option like, I don't know, a sunroof on the car. Makes things more interesting. Makes things better. You'll be a better this. You'll be a better that. You'll be a better businessman. You'll be a better... No, no, no. Old things pass away and all things become new. Not by your power. Certainly not by the power of a church. But by the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of Almighty God. If anybody has that testimony, you ought to say amen. Jerry didn't have dual citizenship. We have that in this country and in other countries where you might have been born in one country, but then you have citizenship there and you get citizenship in a new country. Jesus said you enter into a new kingdom. That is a nation power. That is a dominion. 
He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The kingdom is not just a euphemism for heaven. In fact, I would encourage you that when Jesus taught us to pray, he said, after this manner pray ye, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom. His kingdom is not just sitting in heaven. His kingdom has come to the earth. We enter the kingdom and begin the kingdom, the new birth on the earth, but then we enter the gates of the throne room over there. We don't need to act like we just have the power and the authority and dominion of God when we get to heaven. He's king of kings and lord of lords even down here. Amen. So I would say to you that Jerry did not have dual citizenship. He didn't say, I've got the citizenship of the old penitentiary that I was living in, but then I've got also this citizenship. I promise you, when you leave the pen, you leave the pen. You don't want to come back to it. And so the the idea is we must understand when we are born again, we're not born to have two citizenships. One of the kingdom that we used to serve, come on somebody, one of the God that we used to serve, little g, but the God that is the king of kings and of his kingdom. We don't have one foot in his kingdom and one foot in the other. I know we live on earth, but Paul said we are in this world, but not of this world. Why? Because we are of the new birth of the spirit. You're not going to float away. Don't worry. You're still going to be walking on this earth. It's still going to have bad smells and bad sounds and bad feelings. But there's a good God in the middle of all of it. And he will not fail you. So we come into this kingdom by watching how Jesus showed us. I I agree with you 100%. He went to the cross to die as a sacrifice, a sinless sacrifice. He went to the tomb to bury that body and to go into the earth and get the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And he rose up on the third day with power and victory in his hands. That's what Jesus did. And it is worth celebrating just that. But we should also understand that Paul said that I want the power of his resurrection. But then he said, but I must walk through the fellowship of his sufferings. What is that? I go to the cross in repentance. I go to the tomb, Paul said. We are buried with him through baptism. This is just Bible. This isn't my philosophy. This is in your Bible, the book. We are buried with him through baptism. And then we rise to walk in newness of life because the Holy Spirit quickens, to use the old KJV. It makes alive things that are dead. That's what Jesus did. My heart breaks, honestly, even to this day, if I see a cross with Jesus carved on it, the suffering of this sinless man. But did he stay on the cross? I hate the fact that they buried him in a tomb, a borrowed tomb at that. But did he stay in the tomb? So our life for walking with Jesus doesn't stay on a cross of constant death, And it doesn't stay in a tomb that focuses on what we buried, our past. But it rises into a new life by the power of the Holy Spirit. The new life that you saw Jerry walk through. Now some may think, oh that was just Jerry. Jerry's special. Jerry had something that I don't have. Jerry just had Jesus. He just had the grace and mercy of God. That is the power that helped him overcome and that gave him overcoming strength. And so when we go to the cross, we go to the grave. It's it's ironic the juxtaposition of how Jesus went up was by going down. He ascended to wearing a crown by climbing Calvary's hill and wearing a crown of thorns. He descended into the earth to get the keys and dominion of heaven and earth. That we had released in the garden. And then he rose up and ascended to heaven to take his place in his glorified body on the throne of almighty God. And we can walk that path with him. Romans 8 and 11 says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Everybody say if. That's a big conditional promise. It's like when you tell your kids, if you're good, I'll get you a treat. It's if. Kid's not good. Don't get him a treat. 
I'm trying to tell you how to parent, but don't give them a treat. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit, once again, who dwells in you. Who dwells in you. Not only will the Holy Spirit that birthed Jerry's new life raise his body from the dust, Joni. Raise his body from the dust. But that same spirit will raise you up today. If you yield yourself to him. Today, if you haven't already, you can act on the testimony that Jerry shared so many times with you. Today, you can start a journey with the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, that ends right before his throne. The entrance to Christ's kingdom has come to earth. It's what Jesus told us to pray. Thy kingdom come. The entrance has come to earth, but there is a throne room waiting over there. If the singers and musicians would come, this was the song, Yoni, that was played the first service. I was, I was honestly shocked. The first service after passing of your dear husband. And there you were sitting next to John on the front pew. Nowhere else I want to be but in the presence of the Lord and his people. And we sang this song, and I could hardly speak. I was thinking about Jesus, but I was thinking about Jerry. Someone said it amongst all of our great speakers today. that he, Seeing things that we've never seen, but can. We can. Revelation 7 and 9 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. John the Revelator describes a moment in heaven, just a moment. When a mighty multitude will gather into the throne room of God. People of every tribe, of every kindred, of every tongue. I want to be in that number. Jerry wanted to be in that number. And he wanted you to be in that number. How we all want to see Jerry again. But I have this feeling. That when the veil of this mortal flesh releases us into that throne room. The first one we'll want to see is Jesus. And I promise you, if you want to find Jerry, he'll be wherever Jesus is. The golden streets aren't going to amount to much. The gates of pearl are not going to be really blowing our minds. But when we see the one who died on a cross for us, that's where I want to spend the rest of my eternity. In the throne room.
the throne room of God. God Almighty, That's the destination we desire. John's vision of heaven's throne is just a preview of our final destination. But on the journey, the Apostle Paul gives me a very 
strong admonition, dare I say warning. Acts 20, 28, therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I'm a pastor. I didn't pick it. I'm a shepherd. I can't be a life coach. So, God didn't call me to enable your dreams, goals, and aspirations. A lot of dudes get paid good money for that. He didn't, he didn't call me to encourage your academic career or financial pursuits. There's a lot of good guys that get paid for that. He called me to gather a flock. He called me to shepherd that flock. On a dusty and troubled earth but to a holy and peaceful heaven with rejoicing like we've never seen before. The souls, the sheep, they're not my sheep. Who am I to make a decision for them? They're his sheep. He said they're the sheep of my pasture. He's the good shepherd. The shepherd guides sheep on a path, on a, on a journey, not just in the same field. There's progression. He said, you restore my soul. He restores, not me. He restores my soul. That means in my journey with the good shepherd, there are times that I fall but must be restored. You can't restore what hasn't fallen. You give me green pastures to eat. Well, once that field's eaten, you got to move on. And so if you are a Christian and you are a believer, if you've grazed on the grass of salvation, it's time to move on to other fields. Don't just check the box of the food that got you there. There's more to eat. There's nothing more important than salvation. But once you have yielded in obedience to his word, his love, his grace, his mercy. He keeps leading. That path, I'm sorry to say, according to Jesus, is not always easy. Matthew 7, 13, Jesus' words, not mine. If this causes some consternation don't defer it to me these are his words whatever that consternation is probably conviction don't call it condemnation that we've got to know the difference between condemnation and conviction they are both legal terms but one is a conviction that I say I am guilty forgive me and our judge, who is also our defense attorney, steps up and says, check the file. I think you'll find blood there. Condemnation is a completely different court date. It's not the trial. It's the sentencing. Condemning is not speaking something that pricks the heart. Condemning is not sharing something that's difficult to hear. Condemning is saying death is the sentence. That's a completely different court date from conviction. Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. It is with meekness. It's with humility. With love. And sorrow. That I even have to say that Jesus said that everyone isn't headed to eternal life. Those are the words of Christ. That breaks his heart. It should break our hearts. But I have good news. It's the same good news that Jerry shared. 
I can almost hear his voice echoing the words of the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you unless you believed in vain. Did you know it was possible to believe in vain? Just reading the Bible. For I deliver you first, deliver to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Paul later told the church at Rome, you know, if it's the church at Rome, they're already saved, right? He's writing an epistle to saved people. He wasn't writing instructions to lost people who needed to be converted. That's not the book of Romans. It's a powerful, beautiful book revealing the grace and mercy and love of God like none other. But it's an epistle to the church. He said, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Death is not the end for our souls or our bodies. Death is not the end for Jerry Nur. It's already been said. And death does not have to be your end. I'm going to read these quickly, folks, if you would move. Hebrews 11 and 6, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Faith is critically essential and important. You can't just say, I believe there is a God. You must put your trust and faith in that God. Somebody say His name. It says, believe and diligently seek him. This is the reward for diligently seeking. Ephesians 2 and 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It's the grace of God that I find salvation. It is through my faith in him that I find salvation. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You cannot do anything to be better. You can't do anything to be holier. You can't do anything to be more righteous. Oh, how we wish we could. It's a gift. Free, because he paid for it. But I ask you this question. If we come to faith, and it's not just a faith about a God, but it's a faith and trust in God. And that faith leads me to a cross, which leads me to repentance, which is not just asking for forgiveness. I'm sorry. It's turning away from what I was to become what he wants me to be. Who does the work of forgiving my sins? It's not me. And yet we repent. It's not a work of my flesh. It is the work of his grace and mercy that forgives me. If, if I'm baptized in the water in the name of Jesus, is it the water, the preacher, the tank, the ceremony, the ritual? Who does the washing away of my sins, please? There's no work on my part. If I am filled with His eternal, infinite Spirit, let me show you how much work it takes to receive the Holy Spirit. No work on my part. Who does the work of filling me with His Spirit? Acts 2 and 38, and I close. Then Peter said to them, this is the first message ever preached after the resurrection of Christ. Peter, given the keys to the kingdom, they asked him after he preached, what must we do? Then Peter said, repent. You say, well, that's a work. No, repentance isn't going to get you anything. His forgiveness is the work. And let every one of you be baptized. 
He said, that's a work. I'm sorry. Just toss a bar of soap in there and take a bath. Only his remission of sins, only his blood washes away sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of the gospel that Paul preached. The death and repentance, the burial and baptism, the resurrection, and the spirit that gives life. Dr. Luke gives us eyewitness accounts. In Acts chapter 2, you see the first conversion of the Jews. In Acts chapter 8, you see the first conversion of the Samaritans. In Acts chapter 10, you see the first conversions of the Romans. In, in Acts chapter 16 and 19, you see the first conversions of the Greeks. Every one of these first conversions of people from lost to saved. The book of Acts is not written to a church it's not written. It's written about a church that is being born. Faith in Jesus Christ alone starts this journey. You can't just jump into doing religious rituals and processes and joining churches. Faith in Jesus Christ alone is where this journey begins. Repentance and turning away from an old life, continuing a journey to a new life. Water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ progresses that journey. And the Holy Spirit is the only power that gives me victory and power, not only in this life, but in the life to come. Have faith in Jesus Christ. Allow that faith to lead you to repentance, to baptism. Allow that faith to lead you to be a dwelling place of the Spirit. I will tell you, His Spirit is being poured out all over this world right now. Yes, things are dark in this world. Yes, things are tough in this world. But Paul said, where sin abounds, there does grace much more abound. John said in his gospel that the darkness comprehended it not, but there was a great light. There is more light seen when there's a dark world around. Don't be hopeless by death and don't be hopeless by the headlines of the news. God is pouring out his spirit upon all flesh in these last days. He's doing it. It can happen for you. It can happen for you today. It can happen in your truck on the way home. It can happen on the back of a hog. And I don't mean a pig. It can happen at the house tonight, later on. We, like, we got these buildings, don't get me wrong. I'm okay with AC and padded pews. But good Lord, I like baptizing people in the Indian River. I like baptizing folks in the Atlantic Ocean in a 50-gallon drum. Let's not just come to church. Let's be the church. It can happen for you. Would you stand with me? You can make that decision today. Joni already gave you the invitation. She said, don't leave this place. You stole my line. You can have it. Use it. Don't leave this place without entering that faith and diligently seeking Him today. Would you pray with me? Father, Your Word says, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. Lord, we trust the soul of our dear brother into Your hands. We trust his body to the earth temporarily in hope of your resurrection return and eternal life. Thank you for the gift of Jerry Nur to this family, to these friends, to these churches, to this church. Thank you for that gift. We praise you even though we're crying because you are worthy of our praise. We worship you. Father, I ask in agreement with every brother and sister in this place. And you said, if we agree, we shall have it. Let your comfort be with this family. Wrap them up with your loving arms. Let your nail-scarred hand walk them through this valley so that they fear no evil, for you are with them. 
Let your strength raise them up when they feel like they can't walk. Fill the empty seat at the table, Lord. Be present. Be active. Be God. Draw the hungry. Draw the thirsty to you. Finish the work, Father, that Jerry began in the hearts and minds of every hearer today. I pray this in Jesus' name. And the congregation said amen. You have been most kind and most patient. On behalf of the family, thank you for joining us for this memorial. Before you go, quickly, uh, we have prepared an open house meet and greet in the small building behind this sanctuary. It has a three written on it. I'm smiling and kind of chuckling because every time Jerry walked through our foyer and saw the little concept drawing of a fellowship and ministry center on these empty lots that we've cleared, Pastor, we got to do this thing. This has got to be done. It's not done. <laughs> not because of him. <laughs> you know him. He doesn't wait. We're waiting on the Lord. We're not waiting on finance. We're waiting on the Lord. But, unfortunately, we've got this little building. We love to put on a spread of fried chicken and all the trimmings and sweets and drinks and everything you could want. But there's no way on the planet that everybody could get in there, first of all. We'd be glad to feed you, but you wouldn't be able to fit in the room. So the family said, why don't we do an open house and just do some hors d'oeuvres and drinks and refreshments, and then people can come and go as they please. They can walk in. They don't have to sit down. Whatever is most comfortable for you. There may be some of you here that traveled a long way and you need to get on the road. We understand that. The family said they understand that. And so they are going to give you a courtesy that if you have to run, please feel free to take about five minutes, not each, cumulative, and come and greet the family. They're going to be right here. If you can't make it to the reception, feel free to come and greet them now if you have to get on the road. They're going to wait about five minutes, and they'd love to greet you. They're honored that you were here. I'm sure they'll tell you for themselves. But if you are going to be able to go to the reception, you can exit through the front door of the church. You can hang a right and then take another right, and you'll see this little building back here with a number three on it. And the food is there. Uh, Deacon Chris Vaughn will be there with his wife. That's Jerry's small group leader. Uh, and uh, Andrew may be here as well, Hutchinson. But uh, he will be praying over that refreshment, and you don't have to wait for us. You don't have to wait for anybody. The family will be there forthwith, but you can partake as soon as that prayer is made and enjoy the refreshment and fellowship with each other. But if you would, and you, you need to leave quickly, please don't hesitate. Come forward and greet the family at this time. We'll usher them to the reception area here in just a little bit. Thank you again. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. God bless.